28. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. So over the past three Sundays, the covenants we've learned about have been made with individuals. Yes, they've affected a lot more than the people uh, whom which the, the, the covenants were given, but they were made uh, to individuals. God entered into a covenant with Adam. God entered into a covenant with Noah. God entered into a covenant with Abraham. And this morning, it's a little bit different. Moses is a mediator, but God enters into a covenant relationship now with an entire nation. A people descended from Adam and Noah and Abraham. A people that, called, that were called out by God from the other nations of the earth. That he elected, that he set apart to make his glory known throughout all the earth. A people through which God would ultimately bring peace on earth. This covenant would prove to be the, the next stage of God's divine revelation. God making himself known to the fallen human race, this time to the descendants of Abraham, a people who had by this point become as numerous figuratively as the stars in the sky. Of course, fulfilling one of the promises that God had already made. So this means infinitely more blessings and infinitely more grace where curses should be. And here's how it came about. Very briefly, Abraham's great-grandsons, Joseph and his brothers, had settled in Egypt during a time of great famine. Many of you probably remember that story. Eventually, they grew old and died. But their children's children stayed on in Egypt where they became a very large family. Generations later, though, a new king came to power in Egypt. This pharaoh felt threatened by the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He feared their numbers. He feared their success. He feared their blessings. So pharaoh made them into slaves and mistreated them and made them work harder and harder every day of the week and every day of their lives. There was no peace for them. Finally, these brutally oppressed people cried out to God to rescue them. And God heard their cries. And God remembered his promise to Abram. He would look after his people. He would find a way to set them free. God came to a man named Moses, as the younger children told us, in the form of a burning bush. And he said, I have heard the cries of my people. I have seen their tears. I have come down to rescue them and bring them to a place of peace. Go now to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Moses went and proclaimed to Pharaoh, but Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. <coughs> so God sent ten signs, ten warnings, ten plagues to Egypt and this rebellious king. Water to blood, frogs, gnats, flies, sickness, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and death. Finally, Pharaoh allowed God's people to leave Egypt, and they fled out into the wilderness until God led them to a tall mountain. See, God wanted to speak to his people. God wanted to be with his people. He wanted to show them what he was truly like. He wanted to show them how to live in a way that showed everyone else in the world what he was like, too. So God made another covenant 
a covenant referenced in Deuteronomy 5. Hear, O Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire in the mountain. At the time I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord, because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up to the mountain. Now, granted, some would argue that this covenant is, is simply a renewed proclamation of the covenant that God made with Adam. You remember that, the covenant of works in which obedience equals life and disobedience equals death. In other words, a covenant that presented a, a theoretical way of salvation via perfect obedience to its stipulations and its commands. But I want you to notice, as I noticed this week, how sin complicates things. See, for Adam... Obedience meant nothing more than not eating the fruit of one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the people that God rescued out of Egypt, obedience meant bringing every aspect of life into alignment with God. See, just like during the time of Noah, wickedness and evil had multiplied exponentially. Sin wove its way into the fabric of life to the point that it polluted absolutely everything. Nothing was unaffected. So the covenantal stipulations took on a much greater complexity to address the situation. God handed down laws, instructions for how to live in his presence, instructions for dealing with every aspect of their fallen lives, Instructions for how to experience peace with God and peace with each other. And he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. God requires our full allegiance. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them and worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. God requires appropriate praise and worship and thanksgiving. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. God requires proper respect and awe with regard to his holy name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. <coughs> Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. God requires us to trust him for the gifts and the blessings that we receive. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. God requires us to honor and respect the governing authorities that he has placed in our lives. You shall not murder God requires us to both desire and to work toward the well-being of others. You shall not commit adultery. God requires faithfulness in marriage and chastity outside of marriage. You shall not steal. 
God requires us to be good stewards of our gifts and also to respect the gifts that he has given to others. We shall not give false testimony against our neighbor. God requires honesty. We are to be people who speak and value the truth. We shall not covet your neighbor's <coughs> wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. God requires obedience and holiness, even in our thought life and our desires. These are the commandments the Lord proclaims in a loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain, from out of the fire, the cloud, and the deep darkness and he added nothing more then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to Moses now this is quite the out of reach proposition isn't it as covenant breakers as sinners the people cannot stand in the presence of God lest they die at the sight of his glory and his righteousness. In fact, in Exodus 19, 20, and 24, God reveals himself to the people in dark clouds and fire and smoke. The people fear the presence of God, and rightly so. But here's what we need to understand before we go any further. This covenant that was, that was mediated by Moses is as well as the other covenants that we've looked at, a gracious covenant. It, too, is part of God's unfolding covenant of grace. See, the Lord never meant for the Israelites to think that they could uh, fulfill the covenant and keep his law with, with the perfection that he demands for justification. For the Israelites, the moment they received the law, it served the same purpose as it does in our worship services today. Every week we read the law of God. We recognize our inability to abide by it. And we lower our heads in confession. <coughs> the Israelites, too, heard the law of God, recognized their inability to abide by it, and lowered their heads in fearful confession. Yet while this posture is appropriate and, and very right, it is also important at the same time to remember that the God we worship and the God that we serve and the God that we try to please is a God of grace. And so God graciously calls Moses up, Mount Sinai, into the dark cloud, and Moses obediently follows. Moses returns down from the mountain with a book of the covenant written upon two stone tablets by God's own hand. These were the terms and conditions. Should they obey, this is what they would receive. Deuteronomy 21. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Twice, God, through Moses, highlights the terms and conditions part of this covenant, part of this contract. If you fully obey. And again, I say... I wonder if this seemed like a losing proposition for the Israelites. I mean, look, for those of you who remember the story, even before Moses came down from the mountain, the people had broken the first and second commandments by worshiping a golden calf. If you fully obey. I wonder if any of the people standing in that assembly really thought that was within their reach. Full obedience, complete righteousness as long as they live. That's not even possible for man to adhere to, is it? If 
you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land, and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flock. The basket of your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The first part of these blessings should sound awfully familiar. They will be successful in their dominion over city and country. They will be blessed with offspring. They will be given abundant flocks and herds and food to eat. These are the same gifts that God promised to Adam and to Noah and to Abram. He really is an unchanging God, and his ultimate purposes remain consistent throughout scripture. <clears throat> he truly is a gracious God. And where the other covenants are subject to the fear and dread of a fallen world, the toil and trouble of a broken ecosystem, and the pain and death of a degrading body, here God speaks peace. God speaks peace. This is quite unexpected considering the circumstances. Here is God speaking out of a dark, fiery cloud of smoke, cautioning the people to, to stay at a distance lest they die. Here is God speaking to a people mired in fear and trouble and death. Here is God speaking words of peace. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. God speaks peace to a people familiar with discord and war. But not just peace. Peace through victory. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. God speaks peace to a wandering, nomadic people in the desert. But not just peace. Peace and the rest that comes with it. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised on earth. God speaks peace to a stubborn, stiff-necked people. But not just peace. Peace and and the holiness required to experience it. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath, if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. God speaks peace to his chosen people, but how? Perhaps this is why Peter and Paul begin their New Testament letters with the words grace and peace. Because maybe there can only be peace where there is grace. Then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will fear you. But, as we've seen previously, the curse of fear and death still exist in the world. While the Israelite people will experience peace as they follow God, it will still be accomplished through fear and death. This seems very much like a contradiction in terms. How can peace be given by means of fear and death? This is the, the dilemma that, that Christian people have, have encountered since the fall. How do we exist as holy and set apart as that kind of people in the world? And in a world that quite literally does not allow us to be holy? How are we to follow the rules of the covenants when our very nature, our own flesh, works against us? But Moses reassures the people with a summation of the book of the covenant, painting a picture of the blessings that God truly wanted for them. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity and the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops on your ground. In the land he swore to your forefathers to give you, the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouses of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. Now, 
after the presentation of this beautiful scenario, things get deep. Things get prophetic. For a God who exists outside of time, he's masterful in his use of it. Just as we saw in God's promise to Abram last week, here again there seems to be reference to two, not one, timelines. Because this too is a story about timing. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail, if you pay attention to the commands of Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them. You will always be at the top, never at the bottom. And here, brothers and sisters, we see the promise of one who would come to serve, not be served. One who would come and extend these blessings far past Israel to many nations. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. Here we see the promise of one who will be the head. You will lend to many nations, fulfilling one of God's promises to Abraham. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If, if you pay attention to the commands of the Lord. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. The day Jesus died, the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. It was torn from top to bottom. The day Jesus died, God and his people came together again, no longer needing to be separated. Jesus, the one who came to serve and not be served. Jesus, the one who extended the gift of grace to many nations. We're here after all, aren't we? Jesus, our head. Jesus, who did pay attention to the commands of the Lord and carefully followed them. Jesus, our perfect sacrifice. On the cross, he experienced both fear and death and took them on himself once and for all. And on that day when darkness had come over the earth, the curtain tore from top to bottom. In that moment, because of Jesus' victory, Our relationship with God changed from one of fear and one of fire and one of smoke to one of righteousness and one of grace and one of peace. Do not turn aside (coughs) from any of the commands I give you today, to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. The Mosaic Covenant and the law that comes with it testify to the perfect holiness that God demands. And brothers and sisters, that is important. That is important to get. But what's more important, actually what's most important, is that the covenant and its stipulations trained Israel to look for a savior. See, it was not through keeping the law that the Israelites were commanded to seek salvation. We clearly see in this passage, in the whole testimony of Scripture, that there was nothing in Israel that motivated God to enter into this covenant. So be very careful to note the timing of this story. Because God rescued his people from Egypt before revealing the law. The Lord chose Israel simply out of his his good pleasure and his love. In the same way, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Such is God's electing love at work. By revealing his law to Israel after redeeming the nation from Egypt, by truly revealing his law to us after coming to faith in Jesus Christ, 
God establishes the basic principle of sanctification. Strictly speaking, we do not make ourselves holy. First, God saves us and sets us apart as his holy people. Then we receive and obey his law, expressing gratitude for this gracious gift of redemption. And so, brothers and sisters, we grow in grace and relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And the covenant is relationship with God. The covenant is a gift of grace. The covenant does reveal to us our need for a Savior. And the covenant directs us to Jesus Christ as the only way to peace with God and peace on earth. So as a covenant people today, we say together, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.